Continuing with examples of ring homomorphisms, I want to pause from the concrete examples we just did to do a very important theoretic example for us. Um, then we'll go back and we'll do one more example where everything is uh, very specific just to work out um, some more examples. So the example that I want to cover here that's theoretic, theoretical is if we start with I, an ideal of a ring R, then we saw last time that we can form a factor ring R mod I, and that's going to be our ring S. And we're going to define a ring homomorphism, or define a map that we claim is a ring homomorphism, from R to S, or R mod I, that takes an element of the ring R and just maps it to the coset R plus I. And we claim that this map is a ring homomorphism, where the kernel of this ring homomorphism is the ideal I. Now, let's go through and let's justify why this is so. What I have written here is, let's start out, let's take A and B to be two arbitrary elements of the ring R. What we need to show is three things. We need to show that this map we've defined uh, respects the addition of each of these rings. We need to show that it respects the multiplication of each of these rings. And we also need to show, since I'm claiming that the kernel of this map is I, we need to show that as well. Now remember, when we introduced ring homomorphisms, we talked about how rings are really groups that we've taken and we've added additional structure to them. So in particular, this property that phi of the quantity a plus b is phi of a plus phi of b, this is a group theoretic property. This isn't new to the study of rings. And this idea of taking a, a ring, which is a group, and looking at the cosets defined by a normal subgroup, uh, this is the idea of a group homomorphism, and this isn't new to us either. So if we take for a minute the ring R and the ring R mod I, and just forget that they're rings and remember that they're groups. Uh, and if we remember that an ideal in particular is a subring, which in particular is a subgroup, then what we're looking at here is we're looking at just a group homomorphism from R to R mod I, uh, where I is a normal subgroup. And what we're saying is take an element and map it to this coset that it ought to go to then we're really just studying group homomorphisms. So we've already gone through and with this map, taking this element and sending it to our, you know, the coset defined by that element, we have already studied that this is a group homomorphism. So phi of A plus B is phi of A plus phi of B. And we've also studied that the kernel is what I said it is, right? It is this ideal I uh, because it's the subgroup I. So what we need to do, what this really boils down to for us, is showing that the new thing, the thing that's new to the ring R and the thing that's new to the factor group R mod I, the things that are new there are the multiplication structures that we defined in the last series of videos. So what we need to check is that phi of the quantity A times B is equal to phi of A multiplied by phi of B, where in the first parentheses, phi of A times B, we're saying take the multiplication that's happening inside the ring. And when we're looking at phi of A times phi of B, we're saying let's look at the multiplication as it's happening in the factor ring R mod I. That is, we're taking cosets and we're multiplying them together. So note that, let's write out what phi of A is. It's A plus I. Phi of B is B plus I. And phi of the quantity AB is AB plus I. In the lesson where we learned about factor rings, we saw that if we now have the additional structure that I is not just a subgroup or a subring, but that I happens to be an ideal, then we were able to define a multiplication on the factor group R mod I that turned it into a ring. That is, we were able to multiply two cosets, A plus I and B plus I, and the way in which we did this was by multiplying the individual elements and then adding on the ideal I. That is, the quantity A plus I times the quantity B plus I in this factor ring is equal to AB plus I. And it's this that makes, you can check from everything we've got written on here, that phi of the quantity A times B is equal to phi of A times phi of B. Now, let's do one more very specific example. This example will be nice for us in many ways because what we're going to do is we're going to look at all ring homomorphisms from Z mod 20 to Z mod 10. This is nice because we're dealing with cyclic groups, uh, which is a very special type of group and a special type of ring, 
these rings are finite, so we can kind of work everything out by hand um, without having to think too much more generally than that. And if we were finding all group homomorphisms from Z mod 20 to Z mod 10, then this would be one thing. But what we want to do is find all ring homomorphisms from Z mod 20 to Z mod 10. Now the key here is that both of these rings happen to have a unity. It's the same unity. It's the number one. And with this unity, we know that 1 times 1 is equal to itself, which is 1. If we apply phi to that property, uh, then we see that what phi of 1 must be equal to is phi of the quantity 1 times 1. And since phi is a ring homomorphism, or if we want to build phi to be a ring homomorphism, we need to be able to pull that multiplication outside of the inside of the parentheses, outside, outside of the parentheses that we have. So phi of 1 times 1 should be phi of 1 times phi of 1. So putting that all together, we have that phi of 1, that quantity phi of 1 squared, needs to be equal to phi of 1. And this is the very definition of an idempotent element. So what we're saying is, if we have a map phi from z mod 20 to z mod 10, and we're looking at where should we send the number 1, where should we send the unity, we need to send it to an idempotent element of z mod 10. And being an idempotent element of a ring is a very specific uh, property. So this is going to restrict the number of po possible places that we could send the number 1. So the idempotents of z mod 10 are 0, 1, 5, and 6. That's something you can check. And so these are the only four options for where we could send phi of 1. It turns out that we actually get a ring homomorphism for every choice of these things. So there are exactly four ring homomorphisms from z mod 20 to z mod 10, one that corresponds to each of these choices for where we would send the element 1. Note that this is all we have to do here. Uh, each of these is cyclic groups, and the number 1 additively generates each of the respective groups. And so by figuring out where 1 goes in this ring homomorphism, we're really and truly figuring out where everything goes. Just as to take this example a little bit further, if we specifically picked phi of 1 to be equal to 6, then the image of phi in either way you want to view it in the group or the ring is going to be the group or the ring generated by the number 6 in Z mod 10, which is the set of all even numbers in Z mod 10, 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, although I've written them in order of their powers of 6 inside the ring Z mod 10. Now, Going back to just properties of group homomorphisms, we know that Z mod 20 is a ring of size 20, and we're saying that the image of this group homomorphism has size 5. And we know that the size of the original group divided by the size of the kernel is equal to the size of the image when we have a finite group. And so we conclude from this that the kernel of the map phi has to have size 4. It needs to be a subgroup of z mod 20z of size 4. And there's only one subgroup of z mod 20z of size 4 since z mod 20 is a cyclic group. So we can see that the kernel of this map is that unique subgroup of size 4, which is the numbers 0, 5, 10, and 15.